So in our last video, we introduced the, the topic of um, photosynthesis, and we talked about the how it all works and how it all fits in, into a general picture. But in this video, we're going to be focusing on the structures or the structural part of photosynthesis. So everybody thinks of photosynthesis, most people think of plants, because uh, plants is uh, what typically jump in people's minds because we live in the land. Now remember that the majority of the photosynthesis in the world is actually done by algae because there's way more water than there's land. So even though there are there's more perhaps bigger, right, the plants look. But if you think about it, since there's more water, even those microscopic tiny algae will be doing a lot more photosynthesis than the plants do. So the oxygen of the world is actually coming coming from the oceans. But anyways uh, or a photosynthetic structure that most people recognize is a plant. So here you have a picture of a plant and we're going to be discussing some of the structures of the plant. So you see clearly the roots, uh, which is very important. You're going to see the primary root and the lateral roots extending from it. You also see the tip and the root cap, which is going to be um, where the root is growing. And it, all right, And then they also have these little root hairs to, to uh, absorb a lot of water. Now, then you have the shoot, which is the part that's visible above the body. Now, in the shoot, you have ground tissue, which is the original tissue on the inside of the plant. And then through the inside, you, you see that it also grows vascular tissue, which is what actually carries nutrients up and down the plant. So, uh, very important. We're going to talk about that when you show the leaf again. Now, then you also have the nodes, which are when, when the plants are growing, they form this node for the new leaf to start. And then you have the um, lateral bud, which is the actual right before the, the node actually becomes created. This is an area of growth. And then you have the actual uh, branch coming out of the major ground tissue shoot. Now, in each branch, typically you're going to get some leaves, right? And sometimes flowers, if it's, if, it's, if it's a flowering plant, which can later on develop into fruit, which has seeds on the inside. Then... Also, you will see here that in between each node, it's called an internode, right? And then if you look at the tip of the plant or the area of vertical growth, it's called an apical bud. So instead of a lateral bud, which grows, makes the plant grow laterally, you have the apical bud, which makes the shoot uh, grow vertically. So the plant will grow both laterally, laterally and vertically, and it will also grow thicker too. We're going to talk about how all of this works at the end of the year when we do plant structure in more detail. Now, what we need to focus on today is the leaves, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but before we do that, I also wanted to point out about, all about transpiration. Now, remember that what's happening in transpiration is that plants are picking up nutrients and water through their roots, and then that's going to go uphill through capillary action, which involves adhesion and cohesion to water properties caused by hydrogen bonds, which in turn are caused by the high polarity of water of the water molecules, right? We learned about that earlier in the year. Now, this capillary action is going to facilitate water rising through the vascular tissue inside the chute all the way up to the leaves where the actual uh, photosynthesis is going to be taking place. Now, to help that out along, the leaves are constantly losing water by transpiration through the air, creating a little suckage, which creates, helps capillary action along. Now, this capillary action is sufficient to take water from the roots all the way to the tip, tip of the plant, even if you're talking about a 300 foot long sequoia tree, all right? And obviously, it will take long, really long time for the water to get up there, um, but it will still get up there, which is what matters, and it's quite amazing. Now, if you think about it, the evolutionary reason for this, is that it's an advantage because by making a taller plant with vascular tissue and taking advantage of natural capillary action to break the rule of gravity here, what's happening is that the plants are getting taller and by being taller, they can get the sun first. If you have a little plant up here trying to get that sun, forget it. It ain't going to get the sun because that those leaves are stealing it. So plants that develop better systems, better shoot systems, are going to get the sun first. So this is all this is all about. Now, if you look closer into the actual photosynthetic area, you're going to see the leaves. Now, leaves will have clearly, you see here a cross-section of the leaf on the left side, and you see the vascular tissue. That's the same tissue that's coming through uh, the shoot, but then it, it splits in the lateral buds and goes into the things and then down to the leaves. So that's why when you look at leaves, you see all these little veiny looking things. That's the vascular tissue that's splitting the leaf apart and uh, 
feeding the leaf with the water and the nutrients from the roots. So mm -hmm. now you can see that the inside of the vascular tissue actually has two separate systems. It has xylem and phloem. The xylem is what brings the water and the nutrients from the roots to the leaves. The phloem is what's going to give from the leaves into the body all the sugar that's produced in the leaves. So the uh, xylem takes in the nutrients in the water and then the phloem will distribute the sugar around or the sap around the tree. All right, so this is actually very important. Now, surrounding the central vascular tissue, there is a layer of protection, all right? It protects that. Now, around that, you're going to have the actual leaf. Now, if you look at the structure of the leaf, you'll see that the top, the very top, has a cuticle, which is also at the very bottom. This is like a layer of wax and fat that protects the plant from losing water and also gases. It insulates the plant from the outside and gives it extra protection. As a second protection layer, you have the epidermis on the top and on the bottom. These are tough cells full of cellulose that create uh, the actual shape and hold the shape of the leaf in intact. And it also protects the leaf from the outside from damage. Now you also see up here the palisade parenchyma, which is a ground tissue, the same th kind of thing that started at the shoot. Now what this is, this is, is also, you, you're going to start seeing chloroplasts here, but the majority of chloroplasts are going to be in the bottom here. But basically, what this ground tissue is, is an insulation layer, okay? It basically protects the plant, the plant from the heat of the sun. The, the real photosynthesis is happening in the middle here, in the mesophyll cells, okay? They're called mesophyll because of meso for the middle. But this layer here, which also does some photosynthesis, is mostly in charge of insulating acting like a heat screen to protect the sensitive enzymes from the heat of the sun. And we're going to talk about at the end of these lectures about how extra super intense heat can actually destroy this whole process. So that's definitely very important, which is why it's not in the bottom, because that's not the part that's exposed to the sun. In the middle, you have some spongy parenchyma, which is actually squeezy, water-rich, huge vacuoles inside these cells. These are the mesophyll cells, which are actually going to be doing photosynthesis, and they have huge vacuoles full of water because they're going to be doing this photosynthesis, and they need water. Remember, water is one of the reactants of photosynthesis. Now, in the right side here, you actually see a cross-section of the leaf in a, in, a, in, a, in a microscope. You're going to see the palisade and the vein and the xylem and the phloem in the middle there. You also see the bundle sheet cells, uh, which are present surrounding the, um, the mesophyll somewhere. And then somewhere in the middle, you're going to see the mesophyll here, the spongy mesophyll, then the lower epidermis. Now, notice that the bottom of the leaf has holes called stoma or stomata. Okay. Now, these holes is what allows oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out of the cell, of the, of the leaf. So, I, this is kind of like the noses of the, of the leaves. And... These noses can be opened and closed by these guard cells. If you look here, you see it from the side and from above, all right, the way the guard cells look. Now, basically, the guard cells will open or close to open or close the nose, allowing the gases to come in and out. Also, remember that water will go out of these, which is why it's in the bottom of the leaf. Because if you put water coming out from the bottom here, if this water evaporates, all it's going to do is hit the leaf again, which helps conserve water. But if the hole was up here at the top, when the water evaporates, it would just go to the air, right? So this is a way to preserve water. That's why the guard cells and the holes are in the bottom. Also notice that because the guard cells are right there, the spongy mesophyll will actually have a lot of empty space or gas there. And it needs that because this is actually doing the gas exchange involving photosynthesis. All right? So this is the basic structure of a leaf. Now let's get closer where the cellular uh, photosynthesis is actually happening, which is the actual mesophyll cells. Now mesophyll cells were basically, those, the, every time you see those diagrams of plant cells, what you're actually seeing is a mesophyll cell because they, have, they are rich in chloroplasts. So you see here on the top all the chloroplasts inside the mesophyll cells, thousands and thousands of them. And you see that the diagram on the right side, how it has a cell wall and then inside it has a chloroplast and everything large chloroplasts here on the upper left hand corner but i also put this picture here from the electron microscope which is a real picture showing you that not, not only does it have chloroplasts but it also has mitochondria because remember all cells in the plant are also doing cellular respiration it's getting closer and look at the actual chloroplast now look at the background you see more mesophyll cells now if you get closer to those mesophyll cells you will see that they're full of chloroplasts and inside of each chloroplast you have an outer membrane that protects them and then inside the outer membrane, you have these stacks of grana connected by lamella to give it protection and structure and connection for electron transfer change. 
And inside this, those stacks called granum, you have pills, tiny little pills called talicoids, which is the actual light reactions take place. So the light reactions will take place in those pills, and then the, the in light independent reactions will take place in the stroma, which is the aqueous space outside in between the inner membrane and the talicoids. Now, more important than knowing the structure is knowing why it's like that. So the reason why the talicoids are stacked is because when light is going through them, all right, if one talicoid doesn't absorb all the light that it needs to, the second one will and the third one will. And by stacking hundreds of them on top of each other, you can make sure to capture as much of the light as possible. And even then, only 23% of the light is actually captured by those, by those um, uh, chloroplasts. So definitely important. The chloroplast that first evolved the stacking had an advantage, and that's why later on more and more stacking evolved and we got an advantage of being of having these stacks because more energy is captured, more efficiency. Now, in the aqueous solution, you're going to have the actual cycle. Now, you can see the analogy between this and the mitochondria, right? Mitochondria does a cycle in the matrix. In the stroma, which is a liquid, there's a cycle. Mitochondria does ETC in the, or electron transfers in the cristae, the membranes. The membranes of the chloroplasts are the talicoids, and that's where the electron transfer is taking place between the light reactions. Mitochondria is double membrane. Chloroplasts are double membrane. Mitochondria have their own DNA, ribosomes, proteins, self-replicate, are considered alive. So are chloroplasts. There are endosymbionts that have given advantage to cells that took them in and didn't kill them. And by now, they're inside all plant cells and, and also inside all algae cells. Now, cyanobacteria does this, all this thing without chloroplasts. They don't really have chloroplasts inside. But the chloroplasts themselves could be considered alive. So what are the roles of all these parts? The grana is stacked to create more efficiency. The talicoid membranes is where the light reactions take place. The stroma is where the other reactions, the cycle takes place. And the lumen, which is the inside of the talicoid, is going to be the acidic part that holds all the proton potential. We're going to talk about that. So inside the talicoid, you have the lumen. All right? And it's called lumen because it's really bright, because the light is going through it and being reflected in there. Now. The last thing I have to talk about in terms of structure for photosynthesis, oh, by the way, before I go into that, stoma is the whole. Sto stroma is the, the liquid. How do you remember that? Stoma has an O in the middle, a little O like a hole, right? So that's the hole in the plant cell, in the plant uh, leaves. Stroma has an R in it, R for reservoir or the liquid inside chloroplast. So don't, don't get them confused. Now, inside each of those talicoids, you're going to have pigments that perform photosynthesis. Now what these pigments do is they capture the energy of the sun. Now you don't actually have just chlorophyll. Everybody knows about the green pigment called chlorophyll. And by the way it's green because it captures all the blue light and all the red and orange but none of the yellow and green so that it looks green. You can see that in this graph over here. Now you don't actually use just chlorophyll, you use several pigments to make sure that as the light goes through these pigments in a photosystem, if some of the light escapes one pigment, it won't escape all of the pigments. And that way you capture all the energy that you can out of this light. Which is why there's so many pigments. You see here the redundancy, especially in the blue light, because the blue light carries a lot of energy. So you have all these pigments try to capture as much as possible from the blue light. Now notice chlorophyll A and B are the only ones that capture red and, and yellow. And so they, those are very important as well, and the most important, because they will capture that part of the spectrum as well. But plants are green because they don't absorb any yellow or green. So that's why they're green. Light goes to the talicoids and completely ignores the green. Now, why do plants turn yellow or red during winter? During winter, typically, and only in temperate zones, in the equator, you don't see this happening because the, the sun is always out the same. But in the winter, in the, in the higher latitudes, the sun becomes lower in the sky, the refraction pattern of the atmosphere changes, and, and red and orange light becomes rare, which means there is no advantage, no added advantage of having chlorophyll A or B around. And since chlorophyll A and B are not around, you're, you're no longer captured yellow and orange, which makes the plant looks yellow or orange. So as you go into winter and chlorophyll A and B become less common and the other ones become more common because you need to capture all the blue light because red and yellow are not available anymore because the sun is lower and refracting weird, now the leaves will change color because you don't are no longer capturing red or yellow. And so that's why you get the colors of the fall as the leaves approach winter. All right? So this is why you have pigments 
and accessory pigments are basically capturing different amounts of electricity and send them all in together to capture the light. We'll pick it up from here in the next video.